time for East Bay yesterday. You're listening to East Bay Yesterday. This show is about history, but it's not stuck in the past. Let's begin. Let's begin. I started interviewing people for this podcast about four years ago, in 2016. I've probably done about 150 interviews, and a few of the people I've talked to have died since we spoke. I have this huge list of people I'd like to interview at some point, and I worry that some of them, well, I know that some of them will pass away before I get to. My biggest concern isn't, oh, I won't get to interview such and such prominent person whose story is already well known and has been written about a ton. It's missing the regular folks, the non-famous people that I worry about. Most people have never been interviewed about their life and beyond their immediate families, if even that, their stories won't ever be heard, which, okay, I know this episode is starting out on kind of a dark path here, but the point I'm getting to is that so much history is lost. Not just random people's stories, Really important things, too, like the early history of African Americans in California. There are major gaps in the historical records that, honestly, will never be filled. And here's the crazy thing. A huge amount of what we do know about California's black history comes from one woman, Delilah Beasley. If that name doesn't ring a bell, you're not alone. I'd never heard of her. I'm uh, born and raised here in California, and she's an important figure who was really important to preserving um, the history of African Americans in the West, and I'd never known her. That's Dana Johnson. She's a novelist and an English professor at USC. She recently wrote a short story about Delilah Beasley. I came across her her book, uh, The Negro Trailblazers of California, which she published in 1919. Very little is known about Delilah Beasley personally, but she wrote the book spending almost 10 years writing it, um, researching it, interviewing people. Dana's story about Delilah is fiction, but it's rooted in truth. She built it around the few details that are known about Delilah. Like, for example, this story about an old coat she wore when she was crisscrossing the state, interviewing the last survivors of the gold rush generation and digging through crumbling collections of newspapers and journals. Some of the research I read that she borrowed money from um, Du Bois and I'd read W.E.B. Du Bois Mm -hmm. and I read that she had written him in a letter particularly about just not having money and that she'd had to restitch this coat that she'd had, that she wore sort of as a blanket because she couldn't afford to travel in a sleeper car. She was traveling across California researching her book and doing interviews. And so I thought that was a really interesting detail. So as a result of an example, I wrote a scene about her thinking about this coat and being disheartened by her poverty and trying to get at the emotional toll of doing the kind of intensive work that she was doing without the proper resources. You know, trying to imagine what it must have been like to not have much money, but to really have this passion, to really feel almost this obsessive need to document a Black presence in California. In her story, Dana writes, quote, The coat was dreadful, old, and unfit to wear in public. It had been bright red, but now it looked more the color of burgundy. She'd already replaced the lining twice, and she'd have to replace it again. When she traveled by train, she slept in her seat, and treating the coat as a blanket had left it dirty and stained, 
the stitching frayed. Delilah Beasley didn't leave a diary explaining why she devoted nearly a decade of her life to researching and writing her book, The Negro Trailblazers of California. But she was also a journalist. She had a weekly column in the Oakland Tribune called Activities Among the Negroes, which was a totally unique accomplishment at the time. Delilah was one of the very, very few black people to have a voice in a mainstream newspaper. And it wasn't hard to tell why she pushed herself so hard to make that voice heard. It's just clear that she understood that White America did not care about the Negro, did not care about our contributions, did not care about our history. And so you can just see in her life's work, even in newspapers, there's this feeling of documenting what people are doing, just kind of everyday folks and what they're contributing and what their lives are like. Almost everything in her life points to a kind of insistence on the Negro's place and contribution in California and, you know, of course, in general. Delilah's newspaper column was all about making black culture, black people visible. During an era when people of color were either ignored or portrayed negatively in the media, Delilah shined a light on everyday life. She covered weddings, birthday parties, functions like that. And she also covered the exceptional, like when black political leaders or entertainers would come to Oakland. The implicit message was, we are here. This dovetailed perfectly with her historical writing. For her, history wasn't just things that happened in the past. It was a way of establishing legitimacy, showing we have always been here. She really did prove that, by the way. She discovered that men of African descent were on the very first European ships to explore the West Coast all the way back in the 1500s. She tracked down the names, dates, everything. Unfortunately, Once she collected all her research into a book, she didn't get the response she was hoping for. She kept trying to get it published. She was hitting the pavement, trying to find publishers. And basically, she was just met with disinterest every place she she went. And so she ended up publishing the book herself, again, with borrowed money. And that's kind of how the book came to fruition. And then... It doesn't quite sell as well as she thought. I mean, she sold very few copies. Her goal or her idea or her thinking was that it should and would be in every library in the state, in the country even. And that that's just not what happened. Um, she sold very few. And when it came out, it was panned. So it eventually fell into obscurity. That's kind of why it's not well known. How did a woman with very little formal education and not much money manage to spend nearly a decade creating the most important document about California's black history of its era? What's even in this dense, wide-ranging book, and why should we care now? Will Delilah Beasley ever get the recognition she deserves? We'll be looking at all these questions and more on today's episode of East Bay Yesterday. I'm your host, Liam O'Donoghue. Stay tuned. And this is Brian Edwards Teekert from KPFA. We're going to be joined by Liam live in just a few minutes. Want to use this music break to ask for your support of East Bay Yesterday on KPFA. Uh, It is the last time we'll be able to ask during this show. Our fun drive is ending in A little under 54 hours. We're still about $100,000 away from our goal. The phone number, 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Got about 30 seconds left. And we have one listener, Susan Watson in Oakland, who has offered us what the note says is a speed challenge. Susan says she will double $500 if we can raise $500 to match her. 
And the time frame on this challenge is 15 minutes. We're going to start the clock now. We'll get one more music break to ask for your help. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA or kpfa.org. Back to East Bay yesterday. That's the tough irony about this whole project is while she was out making sure we knew about so many black people that we would never know about, we know so little about her. And that's the thing that's really tough to reconcile because I would like to know so much more about her personal life, her relatives, her mother, her father. And that information seems really difficult to come by. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that I was wondering about when I was reading this is um, I wonder if her lack of knowledge or lack of connection with her own personal family history is one of the reasons why she was so driven to capture black history writ large throughout California. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's one of the reasons I write fiction, because even in my own family, like I never knew my grandfather on either side of my family. There's this history that's just gone. That's a race that no one seems to know. And it's a part of my thing as a fiction writer is similar to Delilah Beasley, which is trying to talk about people to make them live on the page to make us understand who they were in contemporary times as well. Um, Because where we are now will be the past soon enough. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's, yeah, it's that just trying to make sure that we as a black presence, we're always present. The short story about Delilah that Dana Johnson wrote was packaged together in a kind of magazine, along with a non-fictional summary of Delilah's life. The non-fiction part was written by Anna Cecilia Alvarez. Their project is called Trailblazer, and I'll share some more details on it later, but putting it together was a challenge because, as Dana just mentioned, Delilah didn't leave behind much personal info. What we know are, you know, just kind of scraps, both of these records that remain and then of the first few articles that Delilah wrote as a teenager. That's Anna Cecilia Alvarez, whose essay about Delilah is called Deeds Everlasting. What we do know is that she was born, actually her birth date is disputed. We know that she was either born in 1867 or 1871 and she was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. She attended a segregated public school. Um, she had she was the oldest of five. Um, we know that her father was also born in Ohio and it is likely that he was born a free a free man in the antebellum area. However, her mother we know was born in Tennessee and it is unclear, you know, whether she was born into slavery and then later was freed or what her story was. But Delilah's family is at best, one generation, if not less, away from the time of slavery. We probably wouldn't even know these basic facts about Delilah's childhood, if not for a local historian named Lorraine Cruchette. In the 1980s, Lorraine went to Ohio to dig through old census records and newspapers. She ended up publishing a small book about Delilah that's almost impossible to find now. Here's what else Lorraine found out. Her early life is really fascinating. Delilah's in this family that is stable and embedded in a strong community. Um, She's going to school and it's rare, at the very least, for a young black child to start publishing writings in a local newspaper. And so it's clear that she... Um, even in her early teens, was precocious and very talented. And that talent was recognized by both her family and other community members that, you know, it became possible for young Delilah to start 
writing articles as young as the age 13. I mean, how often do you hear of any 13 year old kid <laughs> being, a, yeah. being a correspondent and, you know, then especially in this time. And so clearly like her, her gifts and her tenacity and also her own clarity about what she was meant to do in this world were present from a very young age. Sadly, Delilah's budding career as a young journalist didn't last very long. Tragedy completely changed the course of her life. Her parents died nine months apart from each other when she was still a teenager. And so she went from having certain stability in her home and going to school to all of a sudden becoming an orphan. All her siblings were kind of split up and kind of separated into different homes. And after her parents' death, Delilah basically needed to seek full-time employment to support herself. Um, Pretty soon after the death of her parents, um, started working as a maid for the wife of um, a local Cincinnati judge. That's a part of the story that Dana in her in her piece really beautifully dramatizes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, imagine this young woman who clearly is very gifted, intelligent, and has a strong will and capacity to write. Going through this what must have been a very painful and traumatic experience of losing her parents and finding herself in in the home of this wealthy white family. Even though Delilah couldn't pursue journalism anymore and had to drop out of school, she continued her education by reading books in the houses she took care of. After working as a maid for a few years, she transitioned into being kind of a mix between a healthcare worker, a masseuse, and a beautician. Most of her clients, maybe all of them, were well-to-do white women. And apparently, she was in high demand. It's interesting because how she actually arrived to California is through her work as a masseuse. She has a client who she, I think, starts working with in Ohio who eventually moves to Berkeley. And Delilah must have been so desired and kind of talented in her capacities as this client. This white woman was like, can you please come to California and, you know, offer me your services here? And so Delilah actually first visits California, and I mean, she basically falls in love with the place. Well, she was fascinated, of course, just by the the landscape of the place, but she also was impressed with sort of black folks standing in California. She saw black people living well. She saw them doing jobs that she'd never really considered. Um, She writes about seeing the first African-American firefighters and like the first African-American detective that she's really known about. And so she just saw black people living really well. And she saw different kinds of black people from different countries, speaking different languages, different cultures. And so she was just fascinated by all of that. And, um, She did see, though, that California was not perfect. (laughs) And she understood that racism was prevalent in California as it was everywhere else. So she did have that love of the place, but she was not above critiquing the place as well. And that music gives us time for a a very quick update on our fundraising. Uh, about nine minutes ago, we got a 15-minute speed challenge in the amount of $500. We have raised our first 100 and have just over five minutes left to raise the rest. The phone number is 1-800-439-5732. And this is your last chance to show support during East Bay yesterday. Uh, one of the newest additions to KPFA's lineup. I, I think today's program highlights how important it is to be documenting our history while we still have a chance. Um, If you support this kind of work, and and it's incredible to see the East Bay's history told as a a labor of love project with such clear love for the people of the place that we live in and such an incredible political sensibility, then we're asking you to step up and pledge whatever you can. Um, We have a chance to make that pledge go further. 
The phone number is 1-800-439-5732. That chance lasts about four and a half minutes longer at 1-800-HEY-KPFA. And there's a $400 gap standing between where we are and what we need to claim that extra five. 1-800-439-5732. Now we're down to four minutes and I'm joined live on the line from his COVID bunker, by Liam O'Donoghue, the the host and creator of East Bay Yesterday. Good afternoon, Liam. Good afternoon, Brian. Uh, you know, it's it's great to be on with you again, fundraising, and it's really an honor to be sharing this episode specifically about Delilah Beasley, who was uh, the first uh, black woman, as far as we know, to have a column in a major metropolitan newspaper. That would be the Oakland Tribune, because you know, really, the story is about. Um, a pioneer of independent media, you know, before she wrote for the Tribune, she was really a scrappy kind of uh, independent operator. You know, she wasn't getting institutional funding from any big sources. She was, you know, kind of going around to her her circle of, of friends and benefactors and raising the money she needed in order to put together, you know, her amazing writings to document the history of black California, to cover the black community. And, um, you know, this is long before the days of Patreon and uh, crowdfunding websites and all, all kinds of things like that. And so I just thought it was an appropriate um, an appropriate historical figure to be discussing during this current fundraising drive on KPFA because, you know, KPFA as a, as an independent media organization is really carrying on a tradition of not relying on big institutional or corporate funding, but instead uh, relying on the generosity of the community of, you know, listeners and people who appreciate the kind of news and culture you're bringing to the Bay Area every day. So uh, how how much longer do we, speaking of fundraising, how much longer do we have on the speed challenge? <laughs> Down to business. Uh, we have exactly three minutes left on the clock, and, and you just convinced one caller to get on the line All at right. 1-800-439-5732. Shout out to Margie, who pledged from Vacaville, and uh, earmarked the thank you gift portion of her pledge. We're not really doing gifts this fun drive. So she, she earmarked that portion of her donation to the undocu- Oakland Undocumented Relief Fund, uh, one of the beneficiaries we've picked doing relief work. Uh, you can join her, spread the support, spread the love, and pledge while your pledge goes further. 1-800-439-5732. There's a second call. Uh, we are now at two Ooh. and a half minutes to go. Uh, and again, the, the prize for us, $500 to help pay KPFA's bills. Uh, If we can raise $500, we have a donor in Oakland standing by to double it. We have two minutes and 10 seconds left on the deadline they've given us. Uh, 1-800-439-5732. There's two callers on the line now. We haven't tallied their pledges yet. Uh, Our gap is $400 minus whatever they are pledging. So we're asking you to join with them pull your contribution with theirs and, and help us get all the way there. It, it's a chance for us to make some extra money. It's a chance for you to make your pledge go further. Uh, and frankly, we're, we're running out of time to do it. 1-800-439-5732. Seven o'clock Friday night, for better or for worse, the KPFA fund drive is shutting down so that we can clear up the airwaves for full-time regular broadcasting. 1-800-439-5732. And now we are down to 90 seconds left on that challenge. Liam? Wow, only 90 seconds left. Uh, I'm really feeling the uh, the heat on this one. You know, feeling the metaphorical pressure of hitting that fundraising goal. And, uh, you know, if you are just enjoying yourself, appreciating the program, please, now is the time to get on the line and uh, show that appreciation by helping us meet this 15-minute speed challenge. I'm guessing we've probably only got about 45 seconds left on this one. So if you're thinking about making that call, now is the time to do it. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. That's 1-800-439-5732. Uh, 40 seconds left to convince you to start that pledge. We're at three callers on the line now and All $350 right. to go. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. That's the mnemonic device if you need to remember it. Uh, if you want to save us a couple bucks on the call service we have to use because we are not uh, can't safely operate our own volunteer-run phone room during social distancing, uh, pledge through our website, www.kpfa.org. That will count towards the challenge as well. Uh, but these are the very final seconds we have to convince you to do it, either on the web or on the phone number, kpfa.org, one 800 439 
1-800-795-5732. Uh, it'll be a few minutes before we know if we've made it. You can make it a sure thing. 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Let's go back to the show. After she moved to California, Delilah Beasley must have been really, really busy. She started her historical research, she continued to do service jobs, and she wrote a weekly column. First for the Oakland Sunshine, which served the East Bay's black population, and then for the biggest paper in town, the Oakland Tribune. Reading those columns are another kind of fascinating collection of texts, and you can learn so much about the fabric of daily life among the black community in Oakland. We would almost think of it now as almost like a newsletter, but she was really trying to compile all the goings on of the black community and the activities that would be featured would, you know, go from something like weddings and for baptisms and for different kind of like school activities to um, broader kind of race news about, you know, people who were visiting Oakland who were prominent prominent leaders or, you know, discussing, you know, a recent meeting of the NAACP, you know, news from black churches. Long before the black power movement or ethnic studies classes or Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, there was Delilah Beasley alone on her pedestal at a newspaper where every other writer was white, persistently pushing week after week for respect and representation of her people. The mission of her journalistic work was an educational one. I think she really was among people, other people in that time who believed that racism was kind of stemmed from this deeply ingrained ignorance amongst white folk. And if they just kind of knew of the capacities and the achievements of black people that like they would kind of clearly yeah but th that kind of re-education would happen and racism would be abated and there would be this kind of better relationship between the races oakland was less than three percent black at the time so a lot of delilah's white readers probably didn't even know any black folks she wanted to make sure that their opinions were influenced by positive stories not just racial stereotypes, which were all too common in the media. She would just have this wonderful capacity of just kind of finding these tidbits of prideful, meaningful news to share. Like she just kind of loved to include <laughs> these um, details of that, you know, that were particularly meant to just kind of communicate the achievements and brilliance of, of her community. Delilah's approach to history was similar to her column in that she mixed stories of prominent figures with regular folks. She's got profiles of people who are part of California's underground railroad system and Black Pony Express riders, alongside little biographies of dentists and teachers. Reading The Negro Trailblazers is such a kaleidoscope of almost scrapbooks from different families and towns and cities and time periods. Historical academic critics of her work would maybe disparage her as indiscriminate, but I think there was actually a real purpose to her wanting to include as many stories of as many Black people as she could Gathering all these stories was not easy. She wrote to every county board of supervisors in California, asking for records on black citizens. She only got two responses. Delilah did some of her research at academic archives like UC Berkeley's Bancroft Library, but she also traveled throughout California, sometimes by train, sometimes by horse and buggy, and sometimes just walking to sit down with elders and get them to open up about their memories. And a lot of those memories were not happy ones. As Anna writes in her essay, in the first decades of statehood, black people could not legally ride public streetcars, attend public schools, attend or perform in certain theaters or bars, or testify in court in any case involving white people. 
So what motivated Delilah to take on this monumental task of expanding her scope beyond celebrating the present to rescuing the past from oblivion? So much of her work is just correcting. She's just constantly having to Mm -hmm. correct the record. I think there's two particular kind of like lies that really bug her and kind of get her to start this work. One is this notion that was being kind of, and to this day is, is a notion that you might hear touted, which is, you know, California is a free state. There was no slavery in California. You know, it was entered into the union as, as a free state. And that was certainly something that particularly white historians were kind of promoting in which Delilah just knew was entirely wrong. That was something that incited her. And then also this specific qualification of a pioneer, which would in kind of like, I don't know, like kind of like California historical record keeping is a very, um, has a very particular definition. And it's almost this like title of pride of, you know, who can really call themselves a true Californian or who had kind of been a pioneer in looking at this and seeing that there, of course, was no, no black people were kind of included in these pioneer registries, Mm -hmm. um, which she kind of immediately knew was false because of course, and she, you know, she starts the Negro trailblazers, like starts by saying like as early, at least as early as white people have been here, black people have been here too. And, you know, they have, and have continued to be present in California as far as like, even like any kind of consciousness of the idea of California as a place had been conceived. And so my suspicion is that it was a particular, the spark that really kind of got her interested in this question was just, again, seeing how black people were entirely absent from the kind of story that were being told about the founding. And yeah, and like, she was like, she's like, once again, like, I need to, I need to kind of correct this because if, you know, if I don't, you know, who else will? going to use that music break for a very quick update on the fundraising operation. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone who pledged uh, the donation that put us over the top by uh, a scant $15 on our initial challenge came from Jane in Mill Valley, who particularly wanted to shout out Amy Goodman from Democracy Now. Um, also, a, a another piece of news from the fundraising operation, we have just received um, a second challenge that is under very unusual terms. This also comes from Oakland. This comes from David. And this is a sustainer challenge. David says, uh, if we can get people listening this hour to sign up for a collective total of $50 a month in sustaining pledges, that is uh, pledges that renew every month and whatever amount you can afford, five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, if, if they collectively add up to $50 a month, uh, which would be $600 over the course of a year. He'll pony up $500 to help us pay bills right now. Uh, I'm guessing that this is a bet, and, and we share this perspective, that the future of sustainability at KPFA uh, is getting more and more of you to give in an automatic fashion. So we need to spend less and less time interrupting our programming for fundraising. Uh, and David has just put his money where that future is. He'll pitch in $500 for the bills we have now. Uh, If you commit to monthly pledges to help us pay them in the future with fewer and shorter fund drives. The phone number is 1-800-439-5732. So think about what you can make room for in in your media budget. 10 bucks a month. It's less than the cost of renting a movie. We can't even go out to the movies anymore. Um, 20 bucks a month. Uh, that'd be almost half of what we have to make to bring in this $500 challenge. And that's less than the price of most newspaper subscriptions. 1-800-439-5732. If you could do, doing the math here, $42 a month, you would still be coming in lower than basic cable in which you pay one of our great media monopolies for the privilege of having CNN and Fox piped into your living room to make you dumber. And in one fell swoop, you would bring in an extra $500 for KPFA. Um, So whatever you can do, step up and do it now. 
uh, and David will make sure we are taken care of in the present. The $500 sustainer challenge gets triggered by $50 a month in sustaining donations. 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Now we've just got about uh, two minutes before we go back to the program. Liam? Yeah, you know, I'm just doing the math myself now too. And if we get 25 people to be $2 a month sustainers, that that adds up to $50 as well. So, you know, it's like every little bit helps. Um, you know, it, it does add up and uh, KBFA has been surviving for a very, very long time. Thanks to the generosity of, uh, you know, people who aren't, you know, media oligarchs. It's not billionaires and people like, uh, you know, Elon Musk who are keeping KPFA afloat is the, is the people that are really kind of scraping together whatever they can afford to really appreciate it and um, sending it our way to keep this incredible programming on the air. So, um, you know, if you're out there, I know I know times are tough, but even if you can uh, jump on that sustainer challenge just a little bit, it does add up. And $50, it seems like a very reasonable goal. Uh, and, and I thank David for setting that because, you know, it gives us something to work towards, uh, you know, that $500 bonus. But um, as you said, it's great to have people's um, commitment locked in. So they're chipping in a little bit every month. And uh, like, I, like I keep saying, it really does add up and help help us pay the bills, keep the lights on and keep these uh, incredible shows coming to you, um, you know, in your living room or in your car or wherever you listen to KPFA every day. Yeah, I like it. It's kind of like giving the way you listen, right? You, you tune in every day. You, you listen a little bit every day. Maybe you catch some of the news while you're cooking dinner or listen to my show up front in the morning uh, on your way to work back when we used to go to work. Um, <laughs> so so give the way you listen uh, just just a steady amount. Um, the, the more folks we have signed up as sustainers, like the more stable this place is, right? A, a steady stream of money that we can count on, that we can plan around has profound stabilizing effects for KPFA. Uh, and if we can bring in $50 a month in sustaining pledges this hour, we get an extra $500 to pay our bills right now. We could use that too. Um, we're almost out of time on this break though. So call 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA. We're online at www.kpfa.org. The phone number one final time, one 800 439 5732. Let's go back to East Bay yesterday. She kind of has the manuscript of the book that she's finally finished. You know, it's been nine years. She thinks she's completed the work. And then she is in Los Angeles and she's kind of attending this memorial for soldiers who had passed away in World War One. And in that service, there basically is no mention of black soldiers serving. Yeah, even like as insinuation that um, black people did not fight in that war. And that, again, once again, really like incensed Delilah and kind of brought her in this state of almost like, yeah, alarm of just like, oh my God, once again, I'm encountering history being erased and rewritten to write black people out. And so she had to literally call the press that was about to print her manuscript and tell them to stop so that she could do research and write as much as she could about the history of African-Americans in the military service so she could add that chapter. And this is something that Dana kind of writes about really beautifully in her story, like the sense that, you know, in some ways, the, the work of that book would never be completed. And at some point she just had to stop because she could have continued finding and correcting and unearthing and rewriting history. One of the reasons Delilah had to stop her research and finally publish Negro Trailblazers of California was because she was broke. For years, she'd been relying on friends for financial support, including the managing editor of the Oakland Tribune, as well as other families who she'd worked for previously. And, you know, you can't borrow money forever. Another reason she had to slow down, she was getting older. This was her passion, and she and she was totally driven to do it, but it cost her, you know, yeah. for health, especially. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, Delilah had to print the book herself since no publisher would touch it, which meant that she also had to distribute it herself. So she hit the road again to visit bookstores and libraries. 
And on one of these trips, Delilah had an accident that resulted in her toe getting amputated. That limited her mobility, but not her writing. After she returned to Oakland, she got back to her Tribune column. In it, she campaigned successfully to get other newspapers to stop using racist terms like darky. She supported the construction of housing for international students at UC Berkeley, despite neighbors' opposition. That was another victory. And of course, she wrote about the lives of regular, everyday Oaklanders. She wrote until she died in 1934 in a hospital from heart problems. Her funeral was packed. When she passed away, I, I, I mean, again, this is now to some degree my own projection. I suspect that she thought that there was a lot of work that she didn't get to do. And I fear that she was particularly concerned about not only just her own personal legacy, but the history that she was really trying to, to document and to share that it would survive. And so I think there's something, oof, like <laughs> it moved me to think of what she would, how, how meaningful it would be to her that her work and her research, like the, the stories that she was really trying to promote are still being spoken about and, are, and people still care. Delilah Beasley was laid to rest at St. Mary's Cemetery in Oakland. And although her work isn't exactly well-known, it does live on. Just one small example. A lot of my research for the episode I did about William Shorey, the West Coast's only black whaling captain, came from his profile in Negro Trailblazers. Without Delilah, that incredible story might have been lost forever. And here's the last thing. The organization that produced the Trailblazer project that included Dana Johnson and Anna Cecilia Alvarez's articles on Delilah Beasley, it's an arts organization called Clock Shop. When I was interviewing Anna, she told me that Clock Shop is currently in the process of putting together an online curriculum about Delilah so that students learning from home can have an opportunity to explore her work about these nearly forgotten chapters of California history. I'll include a link to Clock Shop, where you can check out Trailblazer in my show notes at eastbayyesterday.com. And I'll also post a photo of the house where Delilah used to live. It's at 34th Street near MLK, which is just a few blocks from where I'm reading these words and trying to continue her work right now. And that leaves us just a few minutes at the end of the hour to try to raise the money it takes to keep KPFA going so that we can keep broadcasting that work. The phone number is 1-800-439-5732. And I want to remind you the terms of our present challenge. Uh, this is unusual. David in Oakland has offered to throw an extra $500 at KPFA. If we can enlist $50 a month in new sustaining pledges. That means you make a, a monthly commitment to KPFA. Whatever you can do, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, five people pledging 10 bucks a month would make us that extra $500. Um, having ongoing sustaining pledges, profoundly stabilizing for KPFA. Our goal is to get enough people signed up that way we can start canceling some fund drives. Um, also, because that money comes in at a trickle, David's offering to pay us that $500 right up front so we can pay our bills today, which we gratefully appreciate. So you have a chance to, to make your money count two ways and do it without much of a pinch to your wallet. 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA. Um, we're asking you to join the, the folks who have already pledged this hour so that KPFA can be here for you. And we're also asking you to get in under the wire. Uh, this fun drive is going to end for better or for worse, seven o'clock hours from now. We're all doing what we can. And I know you are all doing what you can as well. And what we're asking you to do this hour is our part, which is to help us make this $500 challenge with your sustaining pledge, 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA. 
or online at www.kpfa.org. 1-800-439-5732. Liam? Brian, I know we've only got a couple minutes left, uh, you know, this hour during the fundraiser challenge, but I just wanted to say a couple minutes to talk a little bit about what KPFA means to me, and hopefully it will inspire some listeners out there, some of you guys to uh, chip in what you can to uh, help us meet our fundraising goal today. I started East Bay yesterday, about four years ago, uh, after getting laid off from my previous job. And uh, at the time, I had virtually zero audio journalism experience. I'd you know, never done a radio show, never done a podcast or anything like that. But I knew that capturing and recording and sharing and celebrating East Bay history was valuable, you know, something important to do. And I felt like there would be an audience out there for it. Um, you know, so I really devoted myself to interviewing people and, and sharing a lot of these under told stories about people like Delilah Beasley, who whose lives, I think, contain valuable lessons about the importance of, uh, you know, independent voices. And within a couple of years of starting East Bay yesterday, I found a home at KPFA, which is, you know, just a perfect fit. For, for putting out the kind of stories that I like to tell. And uh, it's helped me reach such a bigger audience than I ever dreamed I would. And, and I've gotten so much great positive feedback from KPFA listeners over the years, you know, people who have been coming out to my events and tours and sending me emails about how much they appreciate that show. And I know that so many of those folks who I hear from and who I'm in regular contact with, I never would have connected with if it wasn't for KPFA. And so that's why, you know, if you're out there listening right now and you can spare a few dollars, you know, to help us meet this fundraiser challenge. But, you know, really in the big picture, what we're trying to do is keep keep KPFA alive so that there is a place for independent voices in the media out there who don't, you know, fit the mold of what you hear on cable news or on corporate radio, you know, things of this nature. And the media is really in a tough place right now. You know, so many journalists have been getting laid off, especially since the uh, coronavirus crisis started. So now more than ever, it's important to have options out there for KPFA in terms of getting the information that you won't find anywhere else. So once again, if you can afford it, please give a call right now to one 800 Hey, KPFA, and uh, make your pledge. And, uh, you know, I would really appreciate it. East Bay yesterday would really appreciate it. And Brian, I know you'd appreciate it too. Woo-hoo! Speaking as a journalist who doesn't want to be laid off, yes, 1-800-439-5732. Um, but I want to say a, a few nice things about East Bay yesterday too, because uh, I started listening to the, the show as a podcast before we even started broadcasting it at KPFA. And I have learned so much um, from listening to the audio journeys that you take us on, Liam, uh, about you know the indigenous peoples who lived in the Bay Area before we got here. I had no idea about the story of how the Ohlone were basically decertified, derecognized mm-hmm. by the federal government in the early 20th century. Um, to uh, Oakland as a hotbed, a gathering point uh, for a black lesbian subculture in in the 1970s, something I also had not known about, uh, the history of the place I live. And I feel like I get to see the place we live and the place we share through new eyes and I get to be a better member of the community uh, and I get to like ask smarter questions in interviews with people who've been there <laughs> here their whole lives um, because of the work that you do educating all of us and, and putting us in touch with, with parts of our history there that do not typically make it into like official histories or onto mm-hmm. bronze plaques or statues or monuments um, and I think it speaks to the importance not just of having the work, but of having a community institution like KPFA that connects it so there's a platform for the work to reach us. Um, if, if you value this, if you have learned something, if you've been inspired by something, if you feel like you see the world with different eyes because of things you've heard on KPFA, then what we're asking you to do is to come through for this radio station and make sure we're, we'll be able to keep the doors open. The phone number is one 800 439 Five seven three two. Join Lisa, who just made a sustaining pledge from San Francisco. Thank you, Lisa. One eight hundred. Hey KPFA, or online at www.kpfa. 
dot org. Uh, remember, we've got David standing by with five hundred dollars. He's given us a highly unorthodox challenge. It is a sustainer challenge. David said to us, you convince $50 a month worth of people to make sustaining pledges. I formulated that awkwardly. <laughs> I hope you get the point. <laughs> you convince enough people to make sustaining pledges that they're collectively contributing $50 a month. Uh, I will pay you $500 right now. So you have a way to pay your bills in the present and you have a few more people keeping you going in the future. Um, I think that's a great investment in this radio station to claim that $500. We need to meet it with your own. And this is whatever you, you can afford. Uh, it's a sustaining pledge for as long as you can keep it up. A monthly recurring donation, just like paying for Netflix, only hopefully more food for thought. 1-800-439-5732. And just like take a minute to think about where, where you dole out money for information uh, on, on a monthly basis. You know, the thing about like American newspapers, uh, most of which have been snatched up by hedge funds that mm -hmm. are hollowing out the newsrooms is like, Every year, the subscription gets more expensive and the amount of original reporting in the paper gets thinner because they keep laying people off. But uh, subscribing to your local paper, you're easily out of pocket 20, 30 bucks a month. Basic cable. You know, what, what do you pay for the, the privilege of having home and garden shows uh, and screaming cable news pundits piped into your living room? The, the academic research actually shows watching cable news makes people score worse on like public events quizzes. So think about what it's worth to have KPFA here. Cable subscription a little different depending if you got Comcast or Time Warner, where you live, what the local franchise agreement is. But you really can't get anything under 40 bucks a month. Um, you, you could get us 80% of the way towards the sustaining pledge if you were willing to put that much towards KPFA. 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at www.kpfa.org. Three callers we have on the line right now, hoping that you join them so that we can make that $500 sustainer challenge. Uh, the challenge is made when we have enlisted $50 a month worth of sustaining pledges. 1-800-439-5732. And we're at six minutes to go. Liam? All right, six minutes. We're getting down to the wire now. And Brian, we've been doing these fundraisers together for, uh, I don't know, the last year or two now. We've done a handful of them together. And every single time you and I have been on the air together trying to raise money, we have hit our goal. We're, uh, you know, one of the one of the dynamic duos of KPFA now, as far as I'm concerned. And I would I'm really running. love to hit that goal. <laughs> yeah, I would really love to hit that goal again today. Um, we've had a couple, you know, we, we made our first challenge, that uh, speed challenge. And now we've got this other challenge trying to get, uh, you know, the cumulative amount of $50 of sustaining donations a month so we can uh, get that extra $500 bonus. And it's not just the money coming in that uh, makes me happy, although it's certainly nice to be, uh, know that KPFA is able to, you know, keep the lights on and pay the bills and uh, keep that antenna up, that beautiful antenna up there in the East Bay Hills I often see when I'm hiking up there. But uh, it's the it's the gratitude from people, you know, hearing uh, these, these uh donors calling in and saying, you know, not only here's 20 bucks, here's 50 bucks, here's 100 bucks, but I love KPFA. I depend on KPFA. You know, I don't hear music or news or analysis like this anywhere else. And this is why I'm giving the money. Um, it's just so rewarding to be a part of this team uh, that people value so much. And it, it, I mean, you know, I don't I'm not I don't want to start crying on my microphone here, but it really is heartwarming to know, uh, you know, what a, what a tight knit community this is. And, you know, I talk to people sometimes who come up to me at my events or email me who say they've been listening to KPFA for, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, it's been on the air for so long and really um, it is uh, such an invaluable community institution. In fact, I remember hearing your interview, Brian, a couple weeks ago with uh, that gentleman who wrote the book about KPFA history. And it really is just amazing to be a part of that long, uh, rich tradition of, of being an independent media voice in the Bay Area. And um, all the people who are calling in right now and donating money are a part of that tradition as far as I'm concerned. And again, if you want to be a part of that, if you want to make your voice heard, with your with your pocketbook, with your wallet, with your purse right now, the number that you can call is one eight hundred. Hey KPFA. 
That's 1-800-439-5732. And that leaves us less than four minutes left in the hour. Two Yikes. callers on the line. Um, here's where we stand. We've got David in Oakland standing by. If by the end of the hour, we can sign up sustaining pledges totaling $50 a month, David will pay us $500. That is the challenge. So far, we have enlisted $25 a month in sustaining pledges. We are exactly halfway there. However, we are down to the final three minutes of the hour to raise the final $25 a month. Um, if you haven't pledged before, if you've pledged once or twice, but you're ready to make a more regular commitment to KPFA, make that sustaining pledge now. It will go further for this radio station. one 800 Four three nine five seven three two. That's one eight hundred. Hey KPFA, or online at www.kpfa.org. Uh, it is also your last chance to show your support during East Bay yesterday. The fun drive ends uh, for better or for worse. Seven o'clock Friday night, about fifty three hours from now. One eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. And frankly, it's desperate times. Um, I. I don't need to tell you, we're all living through this pandemic and economic collapse together. Um, from the perspective of someone who works in media, it has been particularly brutal because we have seen people covering beats, particularly in local mm -hmm. journalism, uh, have their careers ended by the almost overnight evaporation of the advertising money that pays for most of the news reporting in this country. Um, we're hoping the fact that KPFA has a different model will get us through it. Uh, we're putting the question to you. We have two minutes left to make the sustainer challenge. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-HEY-KPFA or online at kpfa.org. Uh, and I've been corrected by our engineer. We have one minute left to make that challenge uh, because of the time she needs to make the transition to the next show. 1-800-439-5732. Yikes! 1-800-HEY-KPFA or kpfa.org. Liam? Just real quick, this is a true story. I was talking to a friend the other day who's been a freelance writer for many years and a longtime KPFA listener. Uh, even though many, many journalists are getting laid off these days, he's one of the lucky few who actually just pulled in a full-time job. So he's finally getting his first regular paycheck in a long time. And he told me that during the last fund drive, he decided that since he'd been, you know, freeloading, he could never afford it before, uh, listening to KPFA for so long without chipping in. Now that he has a regular paycheck, he finally decided to become a sustaining member. And, you know, if you're in a similar position out there where if you're one of the lucky people out there who has a job, who has an income, but have never chipped into support KPFA before, now would be a really, really good time to do it. Um, we've only got about 30 seconds left, I'm guessing, in this challenge. But if you can call one 800 Hey, KPFA, and make your voice heard. That would just be spectacular. So what we're asking you to do is to come through for this radio station and make sure we're, we'll be able to keep the doors open. The phone number is 1-800-439-5732 or online at www.kpfa.org. This is Brian edwards Teekert. We're closing in on the hopefully end of KPFA's spring fund drive. We don't really have an alternative if we don't raise the money it takes to pay KPFA's bills, we go off the air. And we have many fewer tools at our disposal for fundraising than normally. Can't staff our phone room, although we do have a call service. Uh, can't run our thank you gift operation. Can't bring volunteers into our mail room. So we're asking you to just pledge to support the work we do every day on KPFA. We've been interrupting less of our regular coverage to ask for money. It means we've been lagging a little bit behind what we need to make our goal. And so we're asking you to come through in the days that we have left to make sure we will be able to pay our bills. The phone number is 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA or kpfa.org. And thank you. Hi, this is Alice Walker. In these difficult times, I can't imagine living in a world without KPFA. Please donate what you can today. Hi, this is Jeff Chang. For years, KPFA has been a beacon for all of us in times of political darkness and lack of hope. Let's stand with KPFA now. Please donate what you can today. 
Hi, folks. This is Rebecca Gordon. We're living through some pretty hard times these days, and I can't imagine doing it without KPFA. Please donate whatever you can today. Thank you. Donate today by calling 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The following program is...